but we are really stoked to have Ava talking about a really interesting topic. All right, Ava, you're on. Everything yeah. looks great. Take it away. Let us begin. So, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eva Gelperin, and welcome to Hey Siri, Find My Ex, Tech-Enabled Abuse in the Apple Ecosystem. Uh, you may be wondering who I am, unless you already heard Patrick's very kind introduction. I am the Director of Cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I also co-founded the Coalition Against Stalkerware. Uh, you can reach me at eva at eff.org, or you can annoy me on Twitter at evaside. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. And uh, the most important thing that we that we need to talk about is, uh, so what is tech-enabled intimate partner abuse? Um, so uh, as most, as more and more of our lives become digital, uh, abuse has really uh, moved online. Uh, it is now extremely common for us to keep uh, most of our lives in some sort of, uh, of digital device. So your, uh, your calendar is online, your photos are online, your messages are, are in some device, uh, your social media uh, accounts, and more importantly, your location, because uh, now that we all carry cell phones around, uh, we are all essentially carrying uh, uh, location devices. In, uh, in our back pockets at all times. And this is information which is extremely tempting uh, for governments to go after, which is one of the reasons why we've uh, spent so much time, for example, talking about Pegasus. And for exactly the same reason that this information is tempting for, uh, for governments, it is also tempting for abusers. Uh, the primary uh, method in, uh, use that, um, that abusers have used in order to sort of keep uh, tabs on their, uh, on their survivors and targets, victims, uh, is uh, a class of software called Stalkerware. Uh, stalkerware is a class of software that enables someone to secretly spy on another person's private life via their devices. Uh, the abuser can remotely monitor the whole device, including web searches, geolocation, text messages, photos, voice calls, and much more. Uh, these programs are easy to buy and install, and uh, they are commercially available. Uh, the primary uh, marker of, uh, of Stalkerware uh, is that it runs hidden in the background with the affected person knowing or giving their consent. Uh, it is very easy to find these products. For example, this is a Google search for spy on my partner's iPhone. The iPhone is not some sort of magical device that is um, immune to these kinds of, uh, of attacks. So your um, not particularly technically uh, adept abuser starts with a Google search. The Google search provides them with links to a variety of products. Uh, and here is what they go on and do. Uh, so first, the abuser purchases a license for the stalkerware. Uh, then they enter the target's Apple ID and password into the stalkerware uh, website. Uh, one of the... Um, one of the things that actually made it really difficult to convince AV companies at first to um, recognize stalkerware as malicious was they said, well, in order to, to use these products, you need to have the person's Apple ID and password. And if you have their Apple ID and their password, then that is essentially legitimate access to, uh, to the user's device. They should be able to get this information anyway. Why should we label this software as malicious? And I have news for them about how abuse works. It's actually extremely common for abusers to have their, um, their target's Apple ID and password because they're able to coerce it out of them. Uh, then the stalkerware company uses these credentials to log into the target's account and it downloads data from the iCloud backups of devices. And finally, the abuser logs into the stalkerware web portal uh, to view the data, which is updated with every iCloud backup. So 
Apple knows about all of this, and in an effort to combat uh, breached iCloud accounts, uh, Apple has made a bunch of security improvements to their services over the years, which helped make iCloud more secure. The first thing that they did was uh, they added uh, to 2FA to Apple ID. Uh, first, it was introduced. And uh, now it is the default setting for Apple IDs. This is an effective mitigation against abusers who do not have physical access to the target's phone, but it's less helpful for survivors who still live with or share space with their abusers. Apple has more recently put in place restrictions relating to iCloud, and this makes it much more difficult for external devices such as spyware to retrieve backup data from iCloud, whether the account has two-factor authentication or not. So how effective are the iCloud mitigations? Uh, CERTO, uh, a uh, security research company, which is also a member of the Coalition Against Stalkerware, uh, took a look at the top 25 stalkerware apps. And in their report, they wrote that of those 25 apps, uh, only three uh, offer an iCloud solution that could allegedly get all the data from an iCloud backup of an iPhone. Uh, they tested iCloud products uh, from these three spyware providers with an Apple ID that had two-factor turned on, as well as another Apple ID that didn't. And none of the products were able to retrieve data from the backup in uh, their test iCloud accounts. But what about partial data? Uh, of the original 25, uh, another seven spyware providers claim to be able to steal data from iCloud, but in a more limited way. Uh, so rather than acquiring a full backup, uh, they were claiming that they were able to download uh, download data that had been synced with iCloud. However, and that can include things like iMessages, contacts, photos, real-time location, um, Certo uh, tested all seven of these services with their uh, test Apple IDs. Only two of them could successfully download the synced data from iCloud. The other five failed to establish a connection to Apple servers, regardless of whether the account had two-factor authentication or not. Uh, so basically, most of these services don't work. A lot of them still advertise themselves as working. And if you look through the reviews, you can see a lot of complaints. So does that mean that the problem of stalkerware on the iPhone has been solved completely? And the answer is no. So this is WebWatcher. Uh, WebWatcher uses a feature uh, called iTunes Wi-Fi Sync, uh, which is a built-in iOS feature used to back up an iPhone to a user's computer on the same network, as opposed to having to use a, a USB. Uh, this feature is used by WebWatcher as a way to retrieve data from the phone onto a computer on the same network. Uh, this can be the attacker's computer or the victim's own computer. Uh, in addition, the hacker can set up a feature that will cause the iPhone to automatically back up all of its data to the computer every time the phone is synced via the network. Usually this is overnight when it's connected to the Wi-Fi. Does it work? Sort of. WebWatcher reviews are full of complaints about the limitations of this product, including the lack of real-time data unless you're on the same network. Uh, so that's great. Uh, however, it is very useful for an attacker that, uh, that lives with their target because uh, the target is coming back to, uh, to the same place as, uh, as their abuser, and they are often using the same network. Uh, indeed, they are using it overnight, which makes WebWatcher perfect for this particular type of scenario. Uh, the other sort of downside of WebWatcher is that it's very easy to detect because all you need to do is check to see if the iTunes Wi-Fi sync is turned on. So it turns out most methods of spying on iOS devices these days are detectable through a thorough review of device and account settings. And uh, to this end, Apple has written a really fantastic manual uh, with the world's most boring name. Uh, it is called Device and Data Access When Personal Safety is at Risk. And I put the URL up here. And let me tell you, I have a huge crush on this manual. Uh, this manual has everything. It has reviews of account settings. It has reviews of device settings. It includes a discussion of the Apple Watch. It has screenshots. It has checklists. This is everything that I could ever want. And I constantly point uh, people who are concerned about their, um, 
about their phones and their their Apple devices and their uh, Apple IDs to this particular manual. It's really easy to go through. I think it's something like 18 pages and you can do the whole review uh, relatively quickly. So everything is great in Apple land uh, until a couple months ago when Apple put out uh, a new personal tracker called the, uh, the AirTag. Um, so tracking and monitoring a person's location without their consent uh, is is really, it's not new. Uh, Apple did not, in fact, just invent stalking. Uh, Non-consensual tracking existed even before the internet. Uh, it's just a lot easier now, thanks to the internet of things and our increasingly digital lives. Because again, we are carrying tracking devices around in our pockets. And when those tracking devices fail, uh, now we suddenly have these, uh, these nifty little IoT devices uh, that track our, our entire digital lives. So the appeal of, uh, of a product like the AirTag is that it's designed to make it easier to keep track of things that you have lost. So the AirTag um, is something that you attach to say your keys or that you stick in your wallet or a bag. And when uh, you then pair it to, uh, to your phone, they communicate over Bluetooth. And when you have, uh, moved your keys or your bag or your wallet uh, a certain distance from your, uh, from your phone, you will get a message. And furthermore, if you are looking for your keys or your bag, uh, you can simply call up Siri and you can say, hey, Siri, find my keys. And it will give you a location if you are within Bluetooth range. If you're not within Bluetooth range, we will talk uh, about that a little bit further down the line. So this is a, a wonderful way of keeping track of your lost stuff. Unfortunately, the flip side of this is, uh, is a problem. Uh, the, you cannot build a device that will track people who have stolen an item without alerting them, uh, that, uh, without alerting them, without also building a tracking device that aids domestic abusers and stalkers. And that's why these devices are usually not marketed for this purpose. So basically you have created something that helps you find lost stuff and that's great. Um, but once you create something that helps you find stolen stuff, then essentially you have also created a perfect stocking device. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the greater impacts here. Um, the advent of the AirTag means that there is uh, increased access and increased awareness of this sort of non-consensual tracking. Uh, it also means that there are more unaware victims. There are people who you know, do not yet know how, uh, what these things are or how they work, and they don't know to look for them. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the way that the AirTag works uh, allows it to leverage a vast network for long-range tracking, which is particularly disturbing. So now we're going to talk a little bit about that. So the close range tracking on, um, on an AirTag is done via Bluetooth. What you do is you pair your phone to, uh, to your AirTag and if you get out of range, you, you, know, you get an alert. Um, and this is fairly normal. We see these sorts of things all the time. It's pretty standard. Um, for example, the, uh, the tile does something uh, does something very similar. You pair your tile to your phone. Uh, you have the tile app installed on your phone. And then um, if you lose your tile, it will let you know when, when you are out of range. And it will also tell you, you know, where your tile is if you have lost it and it's out of range. Um, so with a tile, uh, you are, uh, if you have, you know, lost, lost your thing with a tile attached to it in the middle of nowhere and you are uh, 
you're not near a whole lot of other phones, you're really dependent on somebody else coming along uh, within Bluetooth range who has the Tile app installed on their phone. Um, the AirTag, on the other hand, is considerably more powerful, which is one of the reasons why uh, I, was, uh, I was so outraged when, uh, when the AirTag came out. And what the AirTag does is it turns every single iPhone with Find My turned on into the network which uh, the other AirTags uh, that the other air tags talk to. So you can probably go all day uh, without running into somebody who has the Tile app installed on, uh, on their phone. But uh, going all day without running into Bluetooth range of somebody with an iPhone that has, my, uh, that has Find My installed on it uh, is considerably less likely. Uh, so the, the tracking power of the AirTag is much, much stronger. So Apple uh, was, was not completely blind to the potential for misuse, and it includes some kind of anti-stalking mitigations. And the mitigations are as follows. Uh, the iPhone, if you have an iPhone, and the iPhone notices that there is a, uh, an AirTag that's moving along with you, that is traveling where you are traveling, uh, it will give you a pop-up notice. Uh, furthermore, when the AirTag first came out, uh, it, would, uh, it would wait uh, three days if it was out of range, and then it would start to give a sound alert, which is a little beeping noise. Uh, that beeping noise uh, is not very loud. It's about 60 decibels and is extremely easy to muffle. Uh, so it has kind of a limited utility, uh, especially if the person that you are tracking uh, has, uh, has hearing issues. Um, or again, it's really easy to just like stick it between some cushions or, you know, uh, tape it up so that it does not, uh, it does not make this noise. So the effectiveness of this mitigation is really limited. Um, one of the things that Apple did after the, uh, after the AirTag came out and there were a lot of complaints about its stocking abilities was they shortened the amount of time that the AirTag would take in order to make this noise uh, from three days uh, to one day. So now instead of three days of free stocking, you only get one day of free stocking before the easily silenced beeping noise begins. So what happens if you have an Android? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Uh, the, uh, there is no Android app uh, that allows you, or, or rather Apple did not come out with an Android app that allows you to know when you are being tracked by an AirTag. Uh, and again, the sound alert is not very effective. Uh, furthermore, one of the big problems with the uh, with the little beep noise that uh, uh, that the AirTag makes when it is uh, is out of range of phone with which it is paired is that frequently we are dealing with abusers who live with the people that they are abusing and tracking. I uh, and if uh, the again the uh, the reset timer was at three days when the AirTag first came out. So as long as the AirTag got within range of the abuser's phone every three days, the uh, even the little ineffective beeping noise would not be set off. Uh, and now that's been uh, brought down to 24 hours, which again is still approximately as often as a uh, as an abuser will see their victim, especially if they are living together. So uh, the reset loophole is kind of a big deal. And there are, again, a bunch of reasons why we are concerned about the use of, uh, of air tags as, uh, as part of intimate partner violence. Uh, the first is that a partner can uh, Stick the uh, stick the air tag. Say, uh, 
in the back of a car between the cushions, or they can uh, stick the air tag into a uh, into a bag belonging to the victim that they uh, that they are trying to track. Uh, and again, as long as they come home once every twenty four hours in order to reset, uh, they will never be the wiser, except for. Uh, if they have an iPhone, and if they have an iPhone, they may receive an alert that tells them that there is an AirTag traveling with them. If you have an Android, you are out of luck. So we can talk a little bit how this about how this uses uh, Find My. Uh, we are already seeing news articles, uh, both about the about the tile, which has been out for a very long time, uh, but also about people being tracked using air tags. Uh, my contacts in the domestic violence world uh, have uh, informed me that they almost immediately started seeing air tags appear in the bags and cars of uh, the people that they were working with who were uh, trying to escape intimate partner abuse. Um, there are some options, or rather there is one option right now. Uh, if you are concerned about air tags and you have an Android, uh, which is uh, this, uh, this app right here, uh, AirGuard. AirGuard is uh, up here on, uh, on GitHub and you can install it on your, uh, on your Android and it should tell you whether or not there is an AirTag or some other sort of Find My Accessory following you. Uh, I cannot guarantee this because this is a fairly new app and I have not yet had uh, an opportunity to test it myself. Uh, Apple has also announced that they will be coming out with an Android app uh, but we are led to believe that it will be coming in approximately December, which gives us several months of free tracking and is very disturbing. So what should Apple have done? Um, it turns out that there are actually some guidelines for how you build products that are resistant to technology-enabled intimate partner abuse. Um, the first is to uh, is that uh, you should eh, wrong slide. The first is that you should promote diversity. Uh, when you have teams composed of uh, of many different kinds of people, they are more likely to create products that uh, that address the needs of a more diverse community. Uh, the second is that you need to guarantee uh, privacy and choice. You need uh, you need your products to make it uh, very clear what information is uh, is available to what users and how to lock everything down. Um, the third is that you should uh, build your products in such a way that they combat gaslighting. Uh, one of the ways in which you can do this is uh, by having reliable logs. Uh, on your products to show, you know, are you know, who logged in at what time, what device were they logging in from, and uh, and what did they do? Because uh, gaslighting is really one of the, the most powerful tools of intimate partner abuse. Uh, the fourth is that uh, you should strengthen uh, your security and uh, again the security of uh, of the data that uh, that you are gathering. Uh, one of the interesting things about studying stalkerware is that frequently stalkerware is, uh, is not very effective, but in addition to not being effective, it is frequently not very secure. There have been, uh, I think, something like half a dozen different instances in which a stalkerware product uh, was storing all of the information uh, that was uh, you know, being covertly exfiltrated from various users uh, in a CNC, and that CNC was left wide open uh, or was very easily compromised. Uh, so Apple actually did a fairly good job of that, uh, but that is uh, one, of the, one of the other concerns. And finally, make technology more intuitive. Uh, the easier your technology is to use and the easier it is to understand who has access and who does not have access uh, and how to use all, you know, all of your, your different settings, uh, the less likely it is that your technology will be used uh, for intimate partner abuse. 
Uh, I am not the person who came up with these principles. These principles are uh, are from IBM, and I strongly recommend that uh, that you read their report. Uh, and more importantly, I strongly recommend that Apple read this report before uh, they put out more uh, new and exciting products. So where do we go from here? There. There is good news and there is bad news. Uh, the good news is that uh, when it comes to stalkerware, uh, stalkerware has uh, has definitely seen a downturn in the uh, in the Apple ecosystem. It is harder and harder to use stalkerware. Uh, to spy on somebody's iOS device. Uh, furthermore, we have this wonderful manual. The manual allows us to uh, to lock people out in a way that is uh, is very easy to uh, to implement and that is easy to follow. Uh, the downside is that this manual is in an obscure portion of the internet uh, and does not have a uh, a title that uh, that is very Googleable. And one of the uh, one of the downsides of this is that I frequently have to be the person who points uh, the survivors of intimate partner uh, violence to this manual instead of this manual being very easy to find uh, for survivors. Um, the bad news is that Apple keeps putting out products like the AirTag. So with one hand, they, they take it away. With the other hand, they give it to the stalkers. Um, I was actually so angry about this that I wrote an op-ed uh, with Albert Fox Kahn for Wired called uh, AirTags are a gift for stalkers. Um, and the mitigations that Apple has in place have a tremendous blind spot. Uh, the, remember, the number one uh, principle that people should be following in order to build products that are resistant to intimate partner abuse is diversity on your team. And uh, I don't know how diverse the team was that built the AirTag, but I can tell you that they had a tremendous blind spot and their blind spot was Android users. They simply could not imagine people who lived entirely outside of the Apple ecosystem. And as a result, those are people who are particularly vulnerable uh, to abuse using their product. So everything is great, but also everything is horrible. Uh, I am keeping an eye out for the Android app, which Apple has promised us in December. I, and I am also keeping a very wary eye out for uh, future IoT products because I am fairly certain that that is, uh, is where we are likely to find uh, sort of the most disturbing developments. Thank you very much. <laughs>